Good morning and welcome to our message this morning. With COVID-19, the pandemic has now reached 5 million people across the world. But yet in Queensland, we are growing so much in confidence. In Queensland this week, on uh, the other day, we had no new cases. We're down to 12 active cases. There's a real confidence growing. And we see that in people who now go to shops. We see people who are driving on the roads. It's becoming back to its normal busyness. It's great because we've seen the government lower its restrictions and we've now had a ladies group actually meet at the church for the first time. These are good signs. These gives us confidence that we're growing. But how much more confidence do we have in God? In 1 John, we've been looking at the first two chapters and we see what it means to live a life of a confident Christian through fellowship and with obedience to the Father. Today we move on to chapter 3, in particularly verses 1 to 3, and we see that our confidence is strengthened because of the love of the Father. In fact, the very first three verses of 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, tells us who we are, where we're going, and how to get ready. So let's not muck around and jump straight in. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God? And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Let us pray. Lord, we just pray that you bless us this morning. Allow us to understand your word, not just in our minds, Lord, but in our hearts, and that it may flow through our lives. Lord, I pray that we get a deeper understanding of who we are in you and how you want us to live. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless each one of us this morning. In your name, amen. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. That's our identity. One of the biggest issues in the 21st century, is a loss of identity. People are so confused, they don't know who they are, they don't even know what they are. People are confused with their gender, if they're male or female or something else or something in between. People are confused in so many different areas and it's related to their identity. And God tells us our identity. He tells us it's found in Him. And we are his children. This is a real privilege, by the way. Understand not everyone is called a child of God. In John eight forty three to 44 it says, Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So we live in a world where we think it's not black and white, but lots of greys. We live in a world where we get confused between God's will and our sinful nature. But for God, he's pure. There is no grey. It's either black or white. You are either for him or you're against him. A child of God or a child of the devil. That's why I'm so glad that we also read in Galatians 3, 25 and 26. But now that faith has come, We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Let's start from the beginning in verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. See, it doesn't start with our identity. It actually starts for how we were created. That is out of God's love. It's interesting. Some children are born out of love. In other words, the parents love one another. And when they have that child, they love that child. Some children, though, are not born out of love. 
Maybe there was some bad circumstances. Maybe there was a rape situation. But that child gets treated differently in most cases or feels different in most cases. The fact is, when you are created out of love, it's something that you take with you through life and in many ways gives you confidence in life to know that you are loved. And how much are you loved? Well, in Romans 5.8 it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was willing to die for us even when we did not have a relationship with him. He loved us before we loved him. That is how much he loves us, that he would die for us. Not only does he love us, he calls us his children. We should be called children of God. I'm not an orphan, so I have no idea what it would really be like. But I do know some people who have grown up from an orphanage, and they are torn and they are damaged because they don't know why their parents didn't want them. But when those people find out that God loves them and that God calls them a child of his, there is something special in that. Probably something that we will never understand unless you are an orphan itself. But we do understand what it's like to have the love of a parent and that we are and our identity is found also in that parent when we are so young. It gives us security. It gives us confidence knowing that we are loved and that we belong to someone. See, that sense of belonging is so important. We find it with people who even uh, want, need to join gangs. They need to join a team. They need to ident identify with a group of people. It gives us confidence, it gives us strength, it gives us a knowledge and understanding that we are, that we belong. And so it is important for us to understand that we are God's children and that we belong to him. But the moment that we are identified as a child of God, that puts us in tension with the world. That puts us in tension with the devil. We read that we are either for God or we're against God. We are for Jesus or we're for the devil. The same is in the world. In fact, in verse 1 it says, The reasons why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So this tension in the world can come of two ways. Firstly, it may not recognize us as a child of God. I think of Jesus when he was born. And about six weeks after Jesus was born, he was taken to the temple. Now the fact is, the temple is a very busy place. There are all the religious leaders there. There are people from all over the city. And each one of them, in their own heart and mind, says, I am waiting for the Messiah. And yet, Joseph and Mary, having taken this child up to the temple, no one recognises him. Obviously, Mary and Joseph know who he is. But no one else identifies that this child is special, except for Simeon and Anna. When they see Jesus' eyes, when they see that child, they know who that child is. But the rest of the world does not. The second part of the world being against us is that it actually rejects us. The world system, the world itself rejected Jesus Christ. Even when Jesus was put on trial in front of his own people, the people cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And then yell out, give us Barnabas. We don't want Jesus, we want Barnabas. That's how much the world rejected him, by hanging him on the cross. We live in a world where the people would prefer to worship TV or movie stars who bear their bodies for all to see. For drug-using sport heroes and have posters on their wall. And they will worship those people more than Jesus. We live in a world that rejects Jesus and therefore rejects us. But at the same time, 
we know that we are loved by our Father. We are His children and we belong to Him and our identity is found in Him. Now in verse 2 we read about the promise that we have from our Father. It basically tells us where we're going. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We read this also in Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. When Christ who is your life appears then you will also appear with him in glory. This is a promise that we actually have that when Christ appears we get to be with him. We get to become more like him when he appears. This is a promise that we have. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16 it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Do you know there's over 300 references in the New Testament for Christ's return? This is the confidence that we have. We have confidence that Christ will return because he loves us. I mean, if Christ was willing to die on the cross for us, how much more can we have confidence in knowing that he will come and return for us, to come and to collect us? So Christ has promised us that he will appear. And Christ also promised us that we will become like him. In the second part of verse 2, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In Romans 8.29 it says, For those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. How wonderful it is to know that Christ is going to return and we get to spend eternity with him. Where we will have a new body with no pain, no blindness, no sickness, no pandemics. We'll live in a world where we are blessed by the very relationship of Christ. I should note it says that we will become like him, but it does not say that we will become God's. I say that probably as a bit of a rabbit, uh, for those who know what that means. There are teachings out there. For example, Mormons actually believe that when you die, and if you lived a life good enough, that you become a god. But we see it now also in some more evangelical teaching, under the some of the Pentecostal movement, under this idea that we become little gods. They want to say that when we grow, when we get to heaven, we'll become little gods. I don't want to go into this right now, so I want to shoot this rabbit. But to understand that we become like God does not necessarily mean we become gods. And that false teaching we have to put to bed straight away. So Jesus' promise, God's promise to us is that he shall return, shall become like him. We get to live with him, to be alive without death or destruction, where there's no more pandemics, there's no economic crisis, there's no more pain and suffering. So if that is our destiny, now we have to get ready. What do we have to do to prepare ourselves for his return? We read in 1 John 3 verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So firstly, it's based on hope. Now when the world hears the word hope, quite often they have this idea of something flimsy, something wishful. But our hope is not found in Canberra or in our legal system. It's not found in democracy or that we have hope in our superannuation. It is in Jesus. In fact, as the song goes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So the world doesn't quite understand what hope is until you actually understand what hope is in Christ. A Methodist minister from Sri Lanka told the Faith and Order Commission of the WCC meeting in Ghana 
1974, that he had invited some Hindu friends to tea and asked them to give an account of the hope that they have. It turned out that not only they had great difficulty in understanding what he was driving at, but also that the Tamil language has no word for what Christians mean by hope. See, the hope that we're talking about is different from the hope within the world, and the world doesn't understand it. The world sees hope as, again, wishful thinking, something that's possible. But the hope, unless you're born up in a Christian home, with all a Christian understanding, the hope that we're talking about is hope with security. In other words, it's guaranteed. It hasn't yet arrived, but we are 100% sure we have complete confidence that this is going to happen. The fact is there's nothing comparable to the biblical concept of hope that we can see within the religions of the East or we can even see within this world. Luke 21 verses 27 and 28 says, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now these things begin to take place. Straighten up and raise your hands because your redemption drawing near. So when we talk about getting ready, and it's based on hope. In other words, it's excitement. We're looking forward to it. We know it's going to happen and we're ready to get ready for it. So we're excited about this return. So now we get ready by purifying ourselves. Now understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses us and sanctifies us. But there's also the matter of daily sanctification, about maintaining purity in the face of temptation. An example of this may be that every week I clean my home. I vacuum the floors, I get the house nice and clean. But even if someone comes over through the week, and if you've been to my place, you know that there's still an odd dish that I had to put away. Or there's still a little thing that needs to be cleaned. As every part of our life, we need to constantly clean and to purify. And that's what it is in our lives with regards to sin. James sums this up pretty good for us in James 1, 21 to 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, who, who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. As my lovely wife likes to remind me, is that if I clean up regularly, then I have less mess to clean up. And this is what it's like of us as Christians. If we think that we are saved and we don't have to do anything anymore, and that we just become hearers of the word, then the rubbish within our lives builds up and our lives become so cluttered with the rubbish within it. But if we take the time daily to purify ourselves, to clean our lives, or to clean our home, so to speak, then what we actually find is life becomes less cluttered. Our life becomes more pure. Our life becomes more clean. So don't just leave it piling up and then have one big clean out. But to keep our lives clean all the time. To walk in the life of Christ on a daily basis. So what I'm asking of you is that in the morning, when you get up, understand that your position in life, that you are loved by God and that you are a child of God. Say that with me. I am loved by God and I am a child of God. Also understand that he is promised to come. That he wants us to be like him. And because he is coming, we need to prepare ourselves. So start our lives by cleaning out all the rubbish within our hearts and in our minds. And we will be blessed by God. Let me pray for everyone. Lord, I just thank you for these words. I thank you for these encouragement. 
Lord, it's through this that we can have confidence in you. Lord, you loved us before we even loved you. And so, Lord, I just pray that we're able to respond out of that love to actually honour you. Allow our lives to be worthy, to show glory of you. And even though the world does not know us, Lord, may the world actually start to see that there is something different in us. And so that they may actually ask the question, what is different in our lives? And we can say, you. So Lord, I just pray that you bless each one of us today. In Jesus' name, Amen.